Fail to mention one other family that's been down, uh, the Smiths. They've been battling. Andrea was sick. They went to Texas for Christmas, and she got sick down there, and then they came home, and now Ryan's not feeling well, and so just be praying for them as well. Brianna did say that. So it's going around. Yep. Oh, really? Oh. Absolutely. Yeah, I'd be praying for Troy as well. All right, well, we are going to pick back up. Uh, we've had a couple Sundays off in terms of our uh, study of going through the books of the Bible with Christmas and such. So we'll be back on track today. I'm gonna, we're going to be in 2 Samuel and pick up. Uh, we we actually spent two Sundays on 1 Samuel, just trying to cover everything that was in there. So the book of 2 Samuel this morning, and um, just, again, to kind of get everybody on the same page, understanding that what we have with the reign of, of Saul and David and then ultimately leading to Solomon is a perfect picture of what's coming. We won't be here for most of it or, or any of it. Uh, we've kind of talked about in some of our studies, depending on how you look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and how the Antichrist is going to play every, into everything. There's, there's a shot that we might see the Antichrist as the man of sin in the, in the form of the man of sin and meaning who the Antichrist will will eventually become, we, we, we will probably see that person, that individual. Uh, and if you want my personal opinion on it, he's probably here, not here, but alive somewhere today. Um, and I think when you see him, I, I believe he's going to mimic the life of Jesus Christ. Remember, how are the Jews going to fall so hard for the Antichrist? He's going to fulfill a lot of prophecy. And that's, that's a lot of how he's going to do and, and trick the nation of Israel. So the nation of Israel is looking for a, a Messiah at about 30 years of age, and you're going to see some of that information, how they can figure that out based on what we're going to look at today. You're going to see that Messiah uh, in the form of the Antichrist, the anti-Messiah, come to, come to rule or, or come to the light around 30 years of age. Because that's how old Jesus Christ was, according to the book of Luke. It says he was about 30 years old when he started his ministry. So, everybody that thinks it's, it's the Pope in the current form, or it's uh, you know, one of these older gentlemen, I, I don't. I think the actual Antichrist, probably right now, is in his 20s, somewhere around that, that time age. But, again, that's my opinion. But what you've got set up with all of, of First and Second Samuel is the time period that we are getting ready to embark upon. And for the nation of Israel, this, these two books are extremely important. Because it's these two books that will ultimately refocus their attention in understanding how the history of what they've been through is going to come back to repeat itself, but with the actual figures in place this time. For you and I, it's great study historically. It's it's a great study for prophecy, uh, and then what we're going to do today is tie it into how it applies to our life as Christians. For a number of different reasons, one, we have to be prepared. The Bible talks about in the book of Proverbs about being prepared, the preparations of the heart. So it's important that we prepare ourselves as Christians for our walk with God, because we understand that. It, it's it's like ground zero. You know, if you take 9-11 and play, uh, and I don't know the statistics on this, but I wonder how many folks were, and, and, and it's growing over the years because of the cancers and such, but how many people were affected not necessarily from the actual collapse of the Twin Towers, but were f affected from the, the wave of the dust and the mess that came from the collapse? See, we, we aren't going to actually be in ground zero when it comes to all these events. But what we have to prepare ourselves for is the reverberation 
that comes because of that event and the events that are going to surround uh, the, the tribulation period. Because I do believe 100% with all my heart that we will see some of those sound waves, even though it's not because of the event reverberating out, it will be the events that kind of lead into that actual event. And so we have to know how to be prepared. And then secondly, just as we always, or at least I always try to connect everything together, how does this affect our walk in our day-to-day -day life with Jesus Christ? What can we take from what David went through, what Saul went through, what Solomon went through, and what the whole nation as a, as a whole went through, and apply that to our walk with Jesus Christ in some form or fashion to, to A, make us a better servant, a better Christian, and to B, to open our eyes to the things that can so easily beset us in this life. And so that's, that's my, always my goal when we get into the Old Testament. The New Testament, you're dealing with doctrine. It's, it's pretty easy. It's, it's all thus saith the Lord, when, especially when you talk about the church epistles. But getting the Old Testament... Everybody, you kind of get in that wave. Well, this wasn't really written to me, so how does it apply? And so it's trying to bring it back to a practical application to help us have a better uh, relationship with Christ. Now, I kind of summed up these events as, in, in, specifically in 2 Samuel, as kind of the, the battles of Christianity. Because the, the events that David deals with and the things that he has to face... As I was reading through here and, and trying to break things down and, and pick things apart, it, it just kind of dawned on me that I felt like I was reading, you know, the memoir of a Christian. The battles that now, again, everything here is physical, and for us it's spiritual, but the premises is always the same. And so I, I was looking at it and think, wow, th this is the ebbs and flow of Christianity. This is what happens when a man or a woman or a child looks in the mirror and, and says, you know what, I'm going to step out for the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to make this proclamation that I am going to live my life in a way to serve God. And then, boom, it sets in motion these, these ebbs and flows that come along with life, and it's exactly what David had to battle. And you're going to see, uh, well, if, if you read, I don't know, we'll have time to get all of it today, but... As you look through here, you realize that some of it is brought on by his own stupidity in some cases or or his own faults in some cases. And then some of it's just brought on by just life. You know, you could you could bury yourself in a in a hole and completely separate yourself from the outside world and you still wouldn't live a perfect life. Just because this whole world's under a curse. It's full of sin. Your mind would still wander. So, just by default, we're going to make mistakes. And, and, and you can't fix that. But what you can do is, A, eliminate the mistakes that come from my own self. The things I, I cause in my life. And then, B... Get yourself in a position so that when the mistakes do come, you don't have to spend hours combing through cobwebs and, and kicking stuff out of the way to get to a point where you can fix those. It's instant because your walk with Christ has been refined to a point where when you step off the path, it's, it's a quick back on. And it's not a off the cliff and now it takes you three months to climb back up, to get back on the road. And, and you see both instances all the way through Scripture. Now, you can break 2 Samuel down into three sections, three pretty simple sections. Uh, from chapters 1 to chapter 10, that is going to be uh, the, the rise of, of David as, as a king. That's going to be his the most precious time that he has with God is going to be from chapters 1 to chapter 10. From chapters 11 to 18, that will be his fall and the consequences of his fall. And then from 19 to 24, that will be his restoration. And even in that in itself, you could have a great message. 
uh, because, let's face it, we've probably all been down that road a time or two. You, you're feeling good with God, things are going well, and then you get a little high and mighty and, pride in, and proud in your walk, and then boom, you fall. But the key to understand is God's always there to restore. Now the main character in the book of 2 Samuel, David. And David uh, is, we, we talk about Joseph probably being the greatest type of Christ just because if you take uh, what his life represents and, and the events in his life, they, they mirror, and, and at some point we'll go through that, but they, they mirror very, very directly uh, a lot of what Jesus Christ goes through. But David will be a close second, and maybe first. Some would argue he's probably the greatest type, but he's actually mentioned over 1,100 times in your Bible. One of the one of the most used characters in all of Scripture, next to Christ Himself, and the Antichrist. The Antichrist would be the second most uh, mentioned. He's the the antagonist of your of your Bible. But what you find the difference between David and Joseph, David will actually be put in the place of Christ in several instances. When he writes, like in the book of Psalms a lot, it's David writing, and he's writing in first person. But when you compare Scripture with Scripture, you actually find that what he is saying is things that Jesus Christ did or things that Jesus Christ said. So David gets put into the place of Christ in several situations. And today what you're going to see, just out of his life in 2 Samuel, is that very thing happening. David being put in a place that is extremely reminiscent of two different time periods. At this point, we're future. One now is past, the other is still yet future. And that's kind of where we're going to focus our time, is breaking that aspect of it down. But look how this... We'll start with a little fun facts this morning. We've talked about who Saul represents in the scripture. He represents the Antichrist. We've talked about who David represents. He represents the Lord Jesus Christ. And then who will follow David? Not to jump ahead too much, but the next major character, David's son, Solomon. Now Solomon, if you look at his name, it actually, it, there's a tie between different words. you got Shalom, uh, Salem, Shiloh. And all of those are references to peace. Solomon represents peace, which there again, you have the premillennial return of the Lord Jesus Christ. You have the Antichrist, the Lord Jesus Christ, followed by peace, the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. So even in the order God orchestrates his kings, he's got it set up in a specific way. Uh, look at uh, 2 Samuel chapter 1 and verse 2. It says, and it came even to pass on the third day. Now, what does the third day represent prophetically in Scripture? Second Advent. Remember, a thousand years is as one day. From the first advent of Jesus Christ to the second advent, you have two days. From zero to a thousand A.D. is one day. From a thousand to two thousand A.D. is two days. And somewhere on the third day, somewhere in the third millennia, which we are currently residing in, Jesus Christ will return. So, I guess if you're looking for, you know, uh, a date, you know, the are we close yet, you can be assured that it will happen before 2,999, right? So, we're, we're getting closer. <clears throat> But then also look at this. This is cool. The name Samuel we've talked about. His name means the name of El, E-L, as in God, El. You can study out in, in the Hebrew language the different names of God. You've got El Shaddai and El Ohim and all the different names, and, and they represent the different attributes of God. But E-L is, the, is a name for God, the God of gods, the God we serve. So if you look at how 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel tie in together. 1 Samuel, or the first L, the first coming of God, what happens in 1 Samuel? 
God's plan gets rejected, and the people bring in their king, who ultimately leads to their destruction. Does that sound familiar? Yeah, that's the first coming. The first coming of God, that's exactly what happened. God's king gets rejected. The people want their king, and they get total destruction. In 70 AD, they get completely wiped off the, the map for 2,000 years. But then we get into 2 Samuel, and the main character, the main character of 1 Samuel is, is Saul, for, for all intents and purposes. The main character of 2 Samuel is David, who's a great representation of the Lord Jesus Christ. So what you have with the second L, or the second coming of God, is you have the instituting of God's king, David, which is exactly what God will do at the second advent of Jesus Christ. He will institute his king. I mean... How does I, I know this is a rhetorical question, and I know how he does it, but my, our minds just don't go there. How does God, in eternity past, lay all this out? And, and guys, I guarantee it goes even so much deeper than this, but he, he orchestrated 7,000 years of time, even to the degree that when he wrote a book, he would orchestrate it that way. And, and again... It's not even set up this way in the Hebrew Bible. It's only in the Gentile Bible because the order of the books are different. But yet he had it all worked out for exact time and exact day as this, so that when you and I open the book and study, we know exactly what God is preparing to do. You know, I've uh, heard a pastor one time say this, out of all the things that God can do, I found one thing that he can't do. Anybody know what that is? There's only one thing God can't do. Those are all true, but it doesn't fit what I want to say. He can't come fast enough, right? But you're right. He can't lie, and he can't do what you said. <clears throat> but it's interesting that God can set everything up so that you and I sitting here now on the, on the first day of 2023. Almost exactly two, we're, what, we're 10 years shy of, of exactly 2,000 years since the death of Christ. And, and a little bit more shy of that since the Bible was actually completed by John on the Isle of Patmos with Revelation. That he can orchestrate so that you and I can be so prepared we can be as prepared as we want to be as Christians for, for not only today and not only tomorrow and next week and next year, but for every aspect of our life, we can be prepared. No, we don't know what tomorrow brings. We don't even know what this afternoon brings. But we understand that when we rest on the Lord Jesus Christ and we rest on His principles and on His Word and on His truth, that no matter what comes, we're secure. We're protected, we're strengthened, we're forgiven, we're loved. And we can be as ready as we want to be for what 2023 brings to us. Now my hope is we're close. We're close to what 2 Samuel is going to lay out to us. But it doesn't matter. Love thy appearing, earn that crown. But in the meantime, do what you can do today to be prepared for what today brings. Now, 2 Samuel will start with the death of Saul. And it will end with the purchase of the very piece of ground that the temple will once reside. Look at that. We start with the death of the greatest picture of the Antichrist in your Bible. And we end with the purchase of the piece of dirt that will house the temple that Jesus Christ should have sat in. But at least it's the very dirt. Imagine that. That piece of dirt still sits over there in the Middle East. The same piece of ground. The temple's not there anymore, but it's coming back. And it's the same piece of ground that Jesus Christ 
will walk through that eastern gate on, walk through that front gate of that temple, walk through that temple court, walk into the holy place, past the brazen altar and, and all the things that furnish that holy place, and walk through that veil into the holy holies and sit down on that throne. You can't imagine anything like that. I can't imagine anything like that. And when Solomon did it, it didn't come close to what it's going to be like. And when they did it back there in Ezra and Nehemiah, it's not even close to what it's going to be like. 6,000 years of sin and rebellion and fornicating and idolatry and and the cursing of the name of Jesus Christ will all come to an end forever. And you and I will never, ever, ever, ever have to worry about sin anymore. Now, I know technically that will happen to us at the judgment seat, but it will be finalized at the second advent. When God will put his stamp of approval, he'll put that king's seal on everything at that moment. And all righteousness will be established for eternity. I've said this before, but one of the most frustrating things that I dispute with God is why. Why does God allow... Now, don't get me wrong. I have my moments where I'm stupid and I just flat out sin. But I have those moments where I truly just want to do what God wants me to do. I want to have pure thoughts. I want to have pure motives. And I want to have pure worship and, and pure love. Why would God allow us as His children to not be able to have that? when we want it so dearly and so deeply. That's a frustrating aspect of my walk with God. But I understand that's yet for the future. So let's jump into section one here. Before we do, let's, let's ask God's blessing this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much again for today. Lord, I thank you for this holy book and the holy words that are contained on the pages of this book. And Lord, my prayer first fold this morning would be that your words would speak truth to us. Father, maybe today we would see your holy word as something that we have never seen it before. Maybe it will speak to us in a way that we never thought that it could or we never even imagined it could. Maybe, God, today will be a day that you, you turn a rock over in our life and, and we see just your, your majesty revealed in our, in our hearts and in our minds, Lord, and the soul of our body is just filled with absolute joy and and happiness. And then, Lord, secondly, may today be a day that maybe just one, maybe just one person in this world that doesn't know you today, Lord, on this Sunday morning, the first day of the year, that a word would be said, a message would be preached somewhere, a Bible would be read, that the Holy Spirit of God would transform a soul from death to life. And Lord, I pray that maybe today we get used to be that transformation for somebody, to, to share that opportunity. Lord, I pray that the life of David would show us the trials and tribulations of the Christian life, but then also to see how your love always supersedes, your mercy always overcomes, and your grace always abounds. Lord, we love you, we thank you, it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, so section one, this is going to be, again, David rising up to power. And I just want to cover a few little things as we go through here. Uh, let's start out in chapter one. And as I mentioned in verse 14, it says, And David said unto him, How wast thou not afraid to stretch forth thine hand? To destroy the Lord's anointed. This is the death of Saul. And, and actually, uh, Jonathan, you'd asked a question about the whole sword and spear a while back. And I was able to get into this a little deeper this week. So, 
the whole leaning on the spear, that was uh, a, mis a mistelling of the actual events that happened by the, uh, was it the Amalekite? <clears throat> yeah, the Amalekite. He, he changed the story around to try to earn favor with God. You find out what actually happened in, in 1 Samuel chapter 31, that Saul got himself so messed up in his walk with God that he, he killed himself. He fell on his own sword. And it was he's one of seven suicides in the scripture. And what the Amalekite did was try to change the story around to make it seem like he, he saved the day. Because David and Saul were, were at odds with each other for, for the majority of David's adult life. And so the Amalekite thought he could gain favor with God, or with uh, David, by pretending that he, was, he killed Saul and, and took that pressure off of David's life. So that's how that whole thing worked out. But you find out in verse 14 that it kind of backfired on this old Amalekite. Because David looks at him and says, basically, who are you to destroy God's anointed? That could be confusing for a lot of people because we talk a lot about Saul being a type of the Antichrist. But here's the, here's the situation. God put Saul in charge. Proverbs chapter 16 tells us that, and tells us also in Daniel chapter 2, that God puts the people in power that he wants in power when he needs them in power. The Bible says that God created even the, the evil things for a specific purpose. And God put Saul in power for a purpose for the nation of Israel. And it was not the Amalekites' duty to determine when Saul should be in power, when Saul should live, when Saul should die. That was God's call. So even though Saul was not a good king, he was still anointed by God. Not anointed as in the good anointing that you and I think of anointing. Anointing can be a good thing and a bad thing. The Antichrist will be anointed, just not the anointing that anybody wants. The same way Saul was anointed. And then in verse 17, you find out the state that Israel finds themselves in because of the mess that they've allowed themselves to create. And again, God warned them of this back in 1 Samuel with, with Samuel when they picked Saul as their king. It says, And David lamented with this lamentation over Saul and over Jonathan his son. And also he bade them to teach the children of Judah the use of the bow. Behold, it is written in the book of Jasher. The beauty of Israel is slain upon the high places. How are the mighty fallen? That's what happens to a nation. That's what happens to a, a family. That's what happens to a church. That's what happens to an individual. When we do not carry out the plan that God has set for our lives. Plain and simple. And notice that the first thing David wants to do in verse 18 is to teach the children of Judah to use the bow. That's their method of weaponry. For you and I, that's this. Now, ultimately, this is our sword, but it can also be likened to a bow. The, the, if, if you and I expect anything good to come from, again, a church or a family or a nation, you have to teach the children the Bible. Anybody know what Hitler's method of training was? Well before there was ever a, a gun pulled out of a, an armory somewhere or, or, or missiles were ever loaded or anything. Years, decades before. And where? That's right, in the school. He figured out that if you trained a whole generation of children that would eventually grow up to be adults to think a certain way, then they would be able to be utilized for a certain, to carry out a certain plan. Thank you. For those of you that don't understand history and modern history at that, you might want to do a little research this afternoon. Look up Operation Paperclip. 
Operation Paperclip was taking the Third Reich out of Nazi Germany and those that were involved in running it and bringing them to the, oh yeah, the good old U.S. of A. And they don't call it the Fourth Reich in public, but it's the Fourth Reich that's in charge right now. And the same plan they carried out in Nazi Germany in the 20s and 30s is the exact same plan that has been carried out since the 70s here in the United States. Why do you think the hippies were rebelling in the 70s, the 60s and the 70s? Do you think that was just because they had some wild brain idea? No, they were being coerced to do it. And those people became parents. And now look what we got. We've talked about before how quick you can change from a generation, from one generation to another. That's why God says so many times that it's about the children's children of the children. I can't remember where I was reading somewhere the other day. And he carried out seven generations. God listed, I think it was in maybe in Nahum, seven generations he listed out by talking about the fathers to the children, to the children of the children, to the children of the children, 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 children. Seven. Because God understands that it does not take very long to completely change the mindset, bless you, of an entire nation. And then not only that, but an entire, for lack of a better term, I, I don't like this word, but I'm going to use it here because religion, we're not a religion, by the way. Jonathan made it, said it very perfectly eloquently last night. Do you mind repeating that when, when that guy asked you? I didn't put you on the spot, but about when that guy asked you, you about you being religious? Oh yeah, about I I just told I, I was a religionist and uh religion is, is nothing but uh, your works and, and what you can do. That's right. And I said that I just I don't, you know I can do what Christ did for me. Amen. Religion is man made. Christianity is God made. We're not religious. We're, we're Bible believing Christians. And, but regardless, when you get into the, the, the generation of the children and begin to teach them and train them, you completely change the flow of how a, a whole generation thinks. And that's exactly what God, or what uh, David understood here. And that's why he saw it so important that the, the moment he, he wasn't even king yet, getting ready to be, but he understood that the moment that power was transferring, that the first thing he would do is teach the children how to use the bow. Hey, I know we get busy. I know our lives as parents are busy. I know we got things, but do me this one favor. Teach the children how to use the bow. And the first five years, the first six years, the first seven years are extremely tough. But I can promise you this, and God has honored this in my own life, and I'm, you know, maybe tomorrow will be different, but if you put the work in when they're young, by the time they hit 10, 12, 15, that's as far as I can go, because it will pay off. I promise it will pay off. All right. Uh, let's look at chapter 2. And in verse 1, notice. I want you to notice here it says, And it came to pass after this that David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up into any of the cities of Judah? And the Lord said unto him, Go up. That's all I want you to see out of that. Go up. Sometimes people say, I don't, I just, I don't know what to do. I don't know how go up. Now, specifically here, he's going to Hebron, which is a city of refuge based out of Joshua chapter 20. But that's where God's going to begin to establish David. And I'll I'm going to hit on that point a little bit later. When we, when we turn this around to our personal walk, but I just want you to keep that in mind for a minute. Go up. 
Then in verse 4, he says, And the men of Judah came there, and they anointed David king over the house of Judah. This establishes David as the king. Now, he's only king over Judah. Remember, the tribes are split, or, or they're in uh, somewhat of a split scenario because of what happened under Saul. And you've got Israel and Judah split in half. Remember that we one of the uh, seven things we talked about last week was the fact that the nation of Israel will be split when the Antichrist shows up or when Jesus Christ comes back. Right now, they're not. Now, Jerusalem is split, but Israel will actually split themselves and share the land that God had promised them with Palestine. And they're working on it right now. Netanyahu, you'll probably find out, is going to... He's going to back down. He's going to lose his, his position uh, in terms of standing for the nation of Israel, and he's going to allow the Palestinians to have some of the land. They're going to split. And that's one of the huge things to keep your eye on for uh, the tribulation period because they will be split when uh, Jesus Christ comes back. Now I want you to go to chapter 5. Somebody remind me what the number 5 is represents in scripture death now in chapter 5 in verse 4 well start in verse 3 it says so all the others of Israel came to the king of Hebron and King David made a league with them in Hebron before the Lord and they anointed David king over Israel so now he gets the other half now he's king over all Israel and Judah. And it says in verse 4, David was 30 years old when he began to reign. Well, what does that sound like? I already mentioned it. Luke, I think it was in chapter 2 or 3. David or Jesus was about 30 years old when he began his ministry. And notice how long he reigns. And he reigned 40 years. But watch the breakdown in verse 5. In Hebron, he reigned over Judah seven years and six months. And how long did he reign in Jerusalem? 33 years. How long did Jesus Christ reign in Jerusalem? 33 years. It's this verse, along with Daniel's 70 weeks out of Daniel chapter 9, that the, uh, the wise men were able to figure out when Jesus Christ was coming, and you can figure out when he was scheduled to die. And also notice this. You have... 33 years in Israel and seven and a half years in Judah. Forty and a half total years of reign. How long was Jesus Christ here the first time? How long is the tribulation? Same exact thing. Consistency, folks. Consistency. Then in verse 7, it says, Nevertheless, David, um, nope, start, I want to read verse 6. And the king and his men went to Jerusalem. Now that's key because that's the first time that Jerusalem was inhabited by the king. Under the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land, which spake unto David, saying, Except thou take away the blind and the lame, thou shalt not come in hither, thinking David cannot come in thither. Hmm. What did Jesus Christ do during his ministry in Jerusalem? Did he not heal the blind and the lame? The parallels are uncanny. But then you find out that the whole purpose of Jesus' coming was what? To die on the cross. Jesus, not Emmanuel, Jesus. Five letters, five, the number of death. And so you have with David coming into Jerusalem to be king, a picture of Jesus Christ coming into Jerusalem to be king the first time was to die. And then you find out in verse 13 why, Jesus, or why David fell. And David took him more concubines and wives out of Jerusalem after he was come from Hebron. 
Notice it's in verse 13. What was David's downfall? It was his wives and concubines. He got caught up in the world system that eventually pulled him away from what God needed him to do. Then you find out and in, in look at chapter 7. Chapter 7 being the number of perfection in the scripture. Look at verse 10. Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them that they may dwell in a place of their own and move no more. Neither shall the children of wickedness afflict them any more as before time. What's Jesus Christ going to do at the second advent when 777 appears? He's going to establish them in a place where they will not be afflicted anymore. See, in chapter 5, he went up to Jerusalem, but he went up to heal the lame and the, and the blind, just like Jesus Christ did at the first advent, but it led to his destruction and death. But when he comes in chapter 7, he comes back to establish the nation of Israel forever. We'll come back to chapter 7 in a little bit. All right, so that's section 1. Then in section 2, you've got the fall. And in chapter 11 is where David gets himself caught up with Bathsheba. Now, a couple verses I want to point out. I want to show you why this happened. I need to show you why this happened so that you yourself can make sure that you don't get caught up in the sins of the world. Chapter 11, verse 1, And it came to pass after the year was expired. Well, hey, that's fitting for today, isn't it? At the time when kings go forth to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. Well, praise God, right? Victory over the enemies. Good way to start the new year. Except, what did the battle chief not do? Look at the rest of the verse. But David tarried still at Jerusalem. Now did the verse not say when kings go forth to battle? Hey, let me tell you something. In this old life, it doesn't matter what position of spiritual growth you get to. It doesn't matter if you're a, a children's school leader. It doesn't matter if you're a, a Sunday school teacher. It doesn't matter if you're a pastor over Ten. It doesn't matter if you're a pastor over 100 or a pastor over 25,000. It doesn't matter if you're a televangelist, a mobile evangelist, a world evangelist. I don't know whatever names they come up for them all. One thing is for certain. You're never to leave the battle. Because the minute you think you're too high and mighty, and the minute you think that... It's not for you. You're, you've come to a point in your life and your relationship with God where everybody else will take care of it for you. It's the very minute that the fall begins. And that's exactly what happened to David. Because it says, And it came to pass in the even tide that David arose from off his bed when he should have been in the battle and walked up on the roof of the king's house when he should have been in battle. And from the roof he saw... And really, it doesn't matter from there. We've looked many times about what your old eyes do in the flesh. It goes all the way back to the beginning with Eve. And it goes through Eve, and it goes through Lot, and it goes through uh, all the way down the line. It's all about what they saw. And that they saw... And that they saw, and that he saw, and that she saw... That's why Jesus Christ says it's better to enter heaven maimed. Pluck your eye out if it causes you to look upon something with a lustful desire. Hey, that's, that's, that might be the hardest thing. Other than controlling your mind, is controlling what you see. Because, I mean, you just can't help it sometimes. You, you don't mean to sometimes. I mean, sometimes you do. But sometimes you just don't mean to. You're driving down the road and boom, there's a billboard. Or you're driving down the road and you look over and boom. Or you open a, a book or a magazine or whatever the case might be. 
Turn the TV on, which I recommend not doing. Everywhere. Best place to stay is in this book. That keeps you in the battle. You can justify a lot of things when you see them think, ah, ah. But I'll tell you what, when you're reading this book and it's reading you, you can't justify much. How are you going to look in the face of God and try to justify something when you're dealing with the Almighty? The, the, how are you going to do that? And then it gets worse because after he has an affairish relationship, he takes the husband of Bathsheba, Uriah, and he sends him out to the front lines of the battle. And basically, no, David doesn't kill the guy, but he knows exactly what he's doing. And God accounts it to him as murder. You know, there's two, two acts of sin in the Old Testament that there was no offering to appease. It just so happened to be the very two sins that David committed here, adultery and murder. So now you took the greatest king Israel ever had, and you now put two death sentences over his head. And literally, in the matter of, well, the first one was a matter of minutes, and then he followed up within a matter of hours. That's how quick life can change. I was looking the other day, I, I someone from the past name came to my mind and I punched their name in just to see, you know, if I could find out maybe where they are and maybe a contact and I found out some information about the person that I wasn't expecting and one decision has changed that person's life forever. It's how quick it happens. And it happens because we put ourselves in situations that we shouldn't be in. David should have never been on that roof of that house that, that evening. He should have been off the battle. And I think one of the greatest downfalls of what society has done, amongst a lot of other things, is made being inside of our homes way too comfortable and way too easy. You know, back in the and I'm speaking out of just what I've seen and read. I don't know. I obviously wasn't living there. But back in the old days, it appears that sitting on an old wood chair on an old dusty floor in a log cabin somewhere was not super comfortable. And on top of that, there was just a lot of upkeep to do to, to put food on the table and, and to keep warm and to prepare for winter and all the other things that had to be done. There wasn't a lot of time just to go sit around. But now we got lazy boys and recliners and and sofas that have refrigerators in them and massagers on them. And, uh, you know, they, they lean back and uh, you can put up your 97-inch big screen that makes it look like the, the movie's in your room, like literally happening right there. And, uh, I mean, who wants, who needs to leave the house? And yet I can tell you right now that most sin that happens in this society happens in a house. I just bet you. Then you find out in chapter 12 that David's old buddy Nathan has to call it out. Imagine how that felt. Nathan comes to David and tells him this whole story about a certain person who committed a certain sin. And in verse 5 it says, And David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, As the Lord liveth, the man that hath done this thing shall surely die, and he shall restore the lamb fourfold, because he did this thing and because he had no pity. <clears throat> then look at verse 7. And Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. It's you, David. You know who Nathan's a type of in this story? He's a type of the Holy Spirit of God. 
The Holy Spirit comes to us and starts to lay out certain things that may be in our life that shouldn't be there. Maybe we don't even know it's about us at the moment. And you know, David says, restore the lamb fourfold. What David doesn't realize is he just put on his own self with that penalty. Because David loses four of his children. He loses one in 1218. He loses one in 1329. He loses one in 1815. He loses one in 20 verse 10. Fourfold. And for time's sake, verse or chapter 13, you'll find the effects that sin brings on the family. It goes all through the house. And in verse 14, his own son turns on him. Chapter 14, sorry. And then in chapter 15, it causes David to actually flee Jerusalem. And then in 18, one of his sons, as I mentioned, Absalom, is killed. Boy, what a turn of events. All for nothing. All for literally nothing. But, as I mentioned, God never leaves you worse than he finds you. In chapters 19 through 24, you get the restoration. Now, David still carries on him the results of sin in his life. But in chapter 19, you find that David returns back to Jerusalem. And in chapter 22, David returns his praise to God. And chapter 22 will be an almost exact match of Psalm chapter 18. David finds in his life the ability, after falling from God's grace, fleeing from Jerusalem, to come back and find praise for God. And then in chapter 24, God gives him the ability to purchase the piece of ground that the temple will eventually sit upon. God still uses him. Now, I want to give you seven quick things how 2 Samuel could play in your and I's life as Christians. In chapter 1, verse 3, David asks the Amalekite one question. Well, he asks him several, but the first one he says, From whence comest thou? From whence comest thou? I ask you. As you come into 2023, you step out of another year past, you look forward to what God may be planning to do with your life, with your family, From whence comest thou? You know, the Amalekite makes up some story to try to build himself up, to, to make himself seem bigger in the presence of David the king, well, the eventual king. And it only leads to one thing, his death. The best thing you can do with God when you come to him is be honest. Be truthful. Be honest about where you've come from, what you've been doing. The second thing, in, in chapter 2, verse 2, God tells David to go to Hebron. Remember, it's a city of refuge. He says, go up. Spiritually speaking, where's God moving you this morning? Where is he telling you to go up to? Where's your Hebron? The place that God has established, and it won't be forever. Remember, he was in Hebron for a while, but then when he became king of Israel, he moved to Jerusalem. It's not necessarily your forever place, but where is God this morning working in your life and telling you to go up? Where is he trying to move you spiritually? What is he trying to get you to do? In chapter 5, verses 19 through 21, Very important thing takes place. And David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up to uh, the Philistines? 
Wilt thou deliver them into my hand? And the Lord said unto David, Go up, for I will doubtless deliver the Philistines into thine hand. And David came to Baal Perazim, and David smote them there, and said, The Lord hath broken forth upon mine enemies before me as the breach of waters. Therefore he called the name of that place Baal Perazim. And there they left their images, and David and his men burned them. Once you make that decision in your life that you're ready to get rid of your past and you're ready for God to move you where you need to go next, in chapter 5 you find out that, yes, God will give you victory over your enemies, but you've got to get rid of the things in your life that will cause you to stumble. And here they burn the images. Notice it wasn't the images of the Philistines. It says... And David and his men, uh, there they left their images. There, as in David and his army. They left their images with the Philistines and they burned it all with the city. What in your life from 2022 needs to be burned out? The fourth thing in chapter 6, verse 2. This is the very first time you ought to spend some time in chapter 6 and chapter 7 in 2 Samuel. For the very, very, very first time, the Ark of the Covenant, which is God's most holy prized possession in the Old Testament outside the temple, because it's in the Ark when they had to move the tabernacle from place to place that they put all the holy things. And the Ten Commandments went in there. And only certain people were allowed to touch that Ark. And you find that out in chapter 6 that when the, the old boy reached up and touched it because it looked like it was going to fall, he died. The very first time that Ark went to Jerusalem. House of Peace. That's the final resting place that Ark will go at the second advent. And you find here in chapter 6 that it's the first time. You know what that's a picture of in yours and I life? That is a picture that when you and I finally decide that we're ready to, to drop what's behind us, as Paul says, looking forward, pressing on, forgetting what is behind. And you get rid of the things in your life that shouldn't be there, and then you get real with God and you say, all right, Lord, I'm bringing all the holy things and I'm putting them where they're supposed to be. I'm furnishing the temple, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, that God has given us with the things that were supposed to be there out of the Ark of the Covenant. And then you find out the fifth thing. I told you David should have been die, uh, killed twice, death penalty, two times over. But you find out from Isaiah chapter 53 and Acts chapter 13 that God institutes a whole separate scenario for David. And it's called the sure mercies of David. And God forgives David for the murder and the adultery that he committed, even though technically wasn't supposed to. Oh boy, what a picture. 1,500 years, 1,000 years before Jesus Christ shows up. 3,000 years before you and I show up, we have a picture of God taking our sin that we should die for. And He gives us sure mercies. That's why David comes back in chapters 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, and he praises God. He devotes a whole chapter to to praising God. Hey, David fled from Jerusalem. That's a picture of you and I fleeing from the face of God. Maybe you've never been there before. Praise God if you haven't. I, I encourage you to never have to get yourself in that. But, but, <coughs> excuse me, maybe you have. But understand this, there are sure mercies out there for you. For every single sin that you and I commit, there is a mercy for it. And it's the one hanging on the cross, or that was hanging on the cross. It's the one that's now seated at the right hand of the throne of God, Hebrews chapter 12, 2. It's sure because 
it's stamped. It's a sure mercy, like absolute. And it's granted to everybody that wants it. And then in chapter 24, after they bring the Ark of the Covenant up, and they get everything situated, notice what David does in chapter 24. And I didn't write what verse it was in, but they build an altar. You know what an altar represents in your life? An altar in the Old Testament is where you came and you laid your offering to God. Whether it was an offering to be forgiven of something, or an offering of thanksgiving, or a peace offering, whatever the offering needed to be, it was a place where you came and you knelt before God and you, you put it on that altar because it's the only thing that would appease your sin. That altar in your and I's life is that place where we go with God and we just get together with Him and we lay it all down for Him. You get to that point in your walk with God when you say, Lord, it's all yours. Take with it what you will. Anybody remember what happened on that altar with Abraham and Isaac? And I know the altar looked a little different, but what happened on that altar with Jesus Christ? That altar is where you and I, Romans chapter 12, 1 and 2, we offer ourselves as a living sacrifice. And we say, Lord, we know, we understand what you've done for me. I now in turn want to give you everything that I can. What a great time to do it than on the first day of a new year. And then finally in chapter, back in chapter 7, The chapter of God establishing David as the king and getting everything prepared for Jerusalem. But notice what he asked David in chapter 5. He says, Go and tell my servant David, Thus saith the Lord, Shalt thou build me an house for me to dwell in? Whereas I have not dwelt in any house since the time that I brought up the children of Israel out of Egypt, even to this day, but have walked in a tent and in a tabernacle. And in all the places where I have walked with all the children of Israel, spake I a word with any of the tribes of Israel, whom I commanded to feed my people Israel, saying, here it comes, Why build ye not me a house of cedar? He said, not one time from the time you left Egypt till now has one person stopped and said, you know what? We should build God a house. Have you ever stopped in your walk with God and said, Lord, I need to build you a house. Not made with hands. And I know this body's a temple, but I'm talking about the place where you come and you give God a final resting place in your life. That tabernacle that he talks about, they were constantly on the move, running from the enemies, moving from one land to another. They, it, was, it was never situated on solid ground. You know what that picture is for me? That picture of a wayward Christian. That's just always moving over here, never can settle down, never can just get secure with God. Until you come to that point where you put your feet on that solid ground and say, Lord, this is where I'm making my stand. I'm giving you a house to dwell in. I'm going to be solid for you. <clears throat> That's what Second Samuel is all about. Getting Israel a, finally, finally, a 
After all the way back with Abraham, when God called him out of the Ur of Chaldees to give him a land that would flow with milk and honey. All the way back in around 2000 BC. And here we are a thousand years later. And God has to ask a question. Nobody has ever even considered to offer me a house. And of that thousand years, how many of those years were wasted in Egypt, wasted in the wilderness? At least 470 that I can think of, almost half the time. Two thousand twenty three, what are you gonna make of it? Empty slate. I mean we're only eleven hours into it. And you've only been awake for well, some of us. Some of you. Jonathan said he woke up what, three thirty this morning? He said I was up before probably most people and I said, No, most people were probably still awake. But even at that, if you woke up at 3 o'clock in the morning, you've only been awake for 8 hours. You're only 8 hours into this thing. you still got an opportunity to make it whatever you want for God. you still got an opportunity to look God and say, Lord, this year, I'm, hey, it's the number of 7. 2 plus 2 plus 3 is 7, right? Let's make this the year that God gets the honor and the glory. Let's make this the year that in whatever capacity God allows us to, we change people's lives. Like for real. Not put a smile on their face. Not make them feel better about things. We really change people's lives. We give them hope. We give them, not give them, but we show them how they can receive the sure mercies of God. And we transform people. And maybe we stand here a year from now, we can look back and say, I truly gave God a house to reside in this year. He had a dwelling that he could trust in. And I was a vessel of honor for God's glory. Hey, what a great opportunity. I'll close out with this. And at the end of chapter 7, after God lays this all out with David, in verse 18 it says, then, then went King David in and sat before the Lord, and he said, Who am I, O Lord God, and what is my house that thou hast brought me hitherto? Maybe you're asking yourself that right now. How could I do it? How can I make a difference? Who am I that God would want to use? Well, guess what? It's the exact same question David asked. You're in good company. And this was yet a small thing in thy sight, O Lord God, but thou hast spoken also of thy servant's house for a great while to come. And this, and is this the manner of man, O Lord God? And what can David say more unto thee? For thou, Lord God, knowest thy servant for thy word's sake. And according to thine own heart hast thou done all these great things to make thy servant known, uh, thy servant known them. Wherefore, thou art great, O Lord God, for there is none like thee, neither is there any God besides thee, according to all that we have heard with our ears. And lastly, in verse 23, And what one nation in the earth is like thy people, even like Israel, whom God went to redeem for a people to himself, and to make him a name, and to do for you great things and terrible for thy land before thy people, which thou redeemest to thee from Egypt, from the nations, of their gods. Now I know verse 23 is talking about Egypt, but that could be the church. And Egypt is the world. And God came to this world to redeem a people out of the mess that is created by man and to show great things and to redeem us. Now it's our duty, like it was David's duty, to make the preparations to get a house built. And the last thing that you read in chapter 24 of 2 Samuel is David going in and making a purchase. The, the guy wanted to give David the land. And David said, no, it's got to cost me something. And David sets the stage for the temple to now be constructed in 1 Kings.
What will you make the preparations for this year for God to do in your life? Let's pray. Father, we thank you again so much for everything that you do. Father, we thank you for the great depth of love that you have for us. We thank you for the sure mercy that you provide to us that was exemplified in David's life. And Lord, just as David didn't deserve to live past his sin, I was not deserving to live on for eternity, Lord. But God, I ask this morning that as we reflect on everything that you've done in our lives for the past year and beyond, that, Lord, we, we look ahead and we consult with you and we reason with you, as Isaiah says. And, Lord, we, we, we ponder in our hearts and in our minds what you will use us for in 2023 and how we can be used to, to serve you and how we can be used to be better leaders of our family, better leaders of our church, better leaders of our community, and wherever you place us. And that, God, we stand firm and we stand strong, no matter what befalls us in the coming months, the coming year. And that, God, this is the year of service to you, that you will get the honor, the glory that you deserve in everything we say, everything we think, everything we do. Father, we thank you for all the blessings and all the love, which in Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, let's close it out this morning.